Yo, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen! Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. As you know, it is the moment you've all been waiting You're for. You're tonight's entertainment. So, guys, as you probably noticed uh, last episode, uh, we tackled our summary in terms of the build-up to Daenerys being the Mad Queen and also... Talked a lot about like the plot holes, the unanswered questions, the characters that never came up again, and just things that were missed in general. And uh, you know, it was just one of those things that you know I, I love talking about them, and that's the whole reason why we did this is to bring those up at the end. Um, so I want to say again, guys, thanks a lot. We had a couple people uh, reach out to us, but anytime you have an opinion on something that you hear. We want you to reach out to us, man. This is what we do this for. We, you know, we're, this is a debate show. We want to talk about it. So if you have any sort of uh, comments or questions or you think we did anything wrong, let us know, guys. We, we, we want that interaction back and forth, man. This is what we do it for. Yeah, man. So. And uh, that, this is all because of you guys. So we're going to kind of give you our, our takes on this one. Yeah. Uh, so exciting news today. What we're going to tackle as we're going to tackle uh, uh, rewrites. Uh, I'm going to do one, and Chase is going to do one, and today, the rewrite, we're really going to focus on the way that they put it out in Season 8 that we saw on screen, talking about six episodes. I'm going to give a rewrite of stuff that I think would have made sense and made the season a lot better, more climatic, and just overall what you would expect from a Game of Thrones that gave us stuff like the Red Wedding, like Oberon getting his head crushed, like Ned Stark getting his head chopped off. Like that like I'm really gonna get into that really dark kind of things they miss out on and tie a lot of the prophecies in. And then Chase, you got something similar, right? Yeah, uh, pretty similar, just a little bit different. And um, then, you know, don't worry, I know this is coming to the close here. It has been one hell of a ride, but <laughs> I think we might have one more Encore episode for you coming. Oh, you want to tell them about it? All right, all right, cool. Yeah, man, so uh, I know that uh, we, we finished out two weeks ago. We did episode six, which was the last episode ever made of Game of Thrones. And then last week, we did our summary. This week, we're doing our rewrites. And, you know, we, we thought about it. We're like, man, do we finish it off here today? And then we started talking and doing some more digging. And we're like, you know what? We're going to give you guys one more bonus episode. <laughs> yeah, we're going to give you guys one more. Um, and I, it's pretty funny at this point because, you know, <laughs> we've been, I go back to February when we started this. We were like, yeah, season eight will be in eight weeks, six months later. Yeah, literally <laughs> yeah. six months later. So that's the plan, guys. <laughs> we're going to tackle uh, two rewrites today. And then next week, we're going to give you. Well, I know Chase is going to put a rewrite out what, as if it was a full couple, like a full more season, a full season, a 10 episode season, or if they did 10 seasons, period. Um, so a lot of people don't know that uh, the original idea was Game of Thrones was going to be 10 seasons before, you know, we talked about this a little bit before. Benninghoff and Wise, they got that contract for Star Wars, which they backed out of. So it got pushed down to eight. So what my next rewrite is, is it's 10 seasons as if they had the time to do what they wanted. So nothing would be rushed. So 10 episodes with 10 seasons. Exactly. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. So basically how like the, it was trajectorying, you know, projecting, right. I should say, from the beginning, like season one through... Se uh, season one through six had ten episodes, and seven and eight shortened it up. So you're gonna be like as if they all had ten episodes. Right. Cool. Yeah, my rewrite's gonna be a little bit different. I'm gonna stick with them having only six episodes in the eighth season for the second one. But instead of doing it like we're gonna do it today, like today we're gonna do it as if the Long Night came first, as it did on show, and the Last War second. Next week, my final rewrite would be if, in my opinion, what they really should have done to make it make sense because remember you know the first and last enemy is death you know i would like to see them do the war for king's landing first and the long night last and that's the rewrite that i will go with next week but this week we're, we're going to tackle what they did as in um we saw on screen from episodes one through six of season eight right and then that way it's kind of more of <clears throat> You know, if we had the realistic expectation as there was no wiggle room there, like we're just doing it the way we are, 
And then, uh, you know, I know you guys uh, are going to be looking forward to House of Dragon in 2022. <clears throat> so there's going to be a... Isn't we got House cool of Fire. Stuff. Is it House of Fire? <clears throat> House of Dragon, because it's based on House of Targaryen, um, which the next episode is going to have a lot of cool surprises. So if you've never read Fire and Blood, you've never read A Night in Seven Kingdoms, we're going to blow this one out of the park. Yeah, I mean, so I would say without further ado, uh, I'll go ahead and get started with my rewrite, and we shall go from there. Let's begin. What we'll do is I'll, I'll go through my rewrite, like, fully uninterrupted, just tell you guys what I think, let Chase put his thoughts in about it, like, after that, then I'll do the same for you. I'll, you know, let, let you go through your rewrite, and I'll mm-hmm. put my thoughts in after, then we'll close out. That okay. sound good? And then you'll do your next rewrite next week. Yes. So, okay. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Exactly. Good stuff. All right, guys, ladies and gentlemen, this is Game of Thrones season eight, brought to you by the Jay Nelster himself, <laughs> Jay Nelly, Jay man. Nelly dog. <laughs> oh yeah, get that Nelly on. So in my Air Force Ones. Oh, I love that <laughs> yeah. song. Nelly is one of my favorite party rappers ever, man. So, what I would like to see here. You know, I didn't have too much problems with the first episode of season eight. It, a lot of cool things came full circle, quotes that kind of made it back around from season one to season eight. This is what I would have really, really liked to see. Now, Sansa, she called all the northern houses to make their final stand at Winterfell. I would have liked to see Howland Reed and the rest of his house answer that call. Because that would help us out with two things. Number one, we'd see Mira again. Because what happened to Mira? Mm -hmm. No one knows. Right? She comes back to defend Winterfell and fight alongside Bran one more time. Maybe she stands with Theon in the long night. That's what what I'm going through with. But I'm just saying, it would have been... I I will have them, Howland Reed in his house, showing up to answer the call. Now... I think that I also, you know, talking about when we get into it, the Jamie arriving at Winterfell, when they're grilling him, it being a much more, I don't know if Jamie's going to make it out of this room alive or if he's going to be a prisoner, because Danny brings up the fact that he tried to kill her. So, now we've got, you know, we've got Howland Reed in Winterfell with all the other northern houses. Mira's there. We're all planning on defending. Winterfell against the army of the dead. You know, Jamie ends up being able to fight alongside them as well. You know, maybe Brienne's speech and Sansa and and John being like, "Hey, listen, we need all the battle-tested warriors that we can get to have a chance here." That's how that goes. Totally cool with that, right? Now, what I think would be even bigger is I know that Danny and Sansa had their conflict. In my opinion, I would have their conflict be a lot bigger and more bitter, huge feud. So that time where Danny goes to like make peace with Sansa, and Sansa's like kind of being bitchy about it, and you know goes, you know, what about the North? I would love to have like Danny not take any shit and just fire right back with something along the lines of uh, the North. Uh, the North is in the Seven Kingdoms, and I am the Queen of the Seven Kingdoms. The North will be under my rule, as will you. That would have been badass, because now you've got some bad blood boiling up, and the reason why I need this bad blood to boil up is going to make sense later on when I get past this, right? So, after that, I would have liked to see the whole Theon thing, because like this whole entire time, you start to see... Danny doesn't have a good time in the north. She's not welcomed there. She doesn't feel like everyone's on her side. She's got her people from Essos in terms of Missande and Grey Worm, and that's pretty much it. Even she kind of gets weird with Tyrion because Tyrion has a fun past with Sans. Like they were married, they were together through a lot of things that happened. So you know she doesn't even know what to think about Tyrion at this point. Varys, I don't ever feel like she's really trusted Varys fully. So she's kind of stewing in her anger of like, you know, how dare these people? I come up here out of the goodness of my heart. I could have just took in King's Landing and let these Northerners deal with the army of the dead and they'd be screwed, right? But instead, like, you know, they're not showing me any sort of like grateful, like, you know, not not grateful at all. They're like, they're very, 
uh, what do you call it? What's the word I'm looking for? Taking me, taking my help for granted as if like I'm required to do this when I'm not, right? So at that point, you know how Theon kind of comes up and embraces Sansa. I would have loved to see that again and just see Danny seep more and more into anger. Because remember, Theon and Yara pledge themselves to Danny. And Danny doesn't really know the backstory and history of Theon being raised by the Starks and how he kind of stole Winterfell from Bran and when Bran was technically the Lord of Winterfell and then how all the stuff that Theon went through. And now Theon's coming back to fight for Sansa and the Starks, not for Danny. So to see, like, you know, her, he just give, like, a formal greeting to Danny and, like, really, like, emotionally embrace Sansa really would drive, like, another nail into how angry that Daenerys would be. Now, imagine this, guys. Daenerys is all built up, frustrated and angry. We get to the part where um, Bran convinces Sam that he needs to tell Jon about his true lineage, okay? So Br Sam goes down to the crypts, same sort of deal. Tells Jon his true lineage. Jon kind of freaks out a little bit, the same way he kind of did, like steps back, and then he has that realization that like, well, you know what? My, my brother and my best friend wouldn't lie to me about this. I know these guys' as character, they wouldn't lie to me. So then what I would say is that at the point where they start making the battle plans and things of that nature, instead of having it wait till the very last second to tell Danny that he, Aegon Targaryen the sixth, like right before the horn sound for the long night to begin, he tells her a little bit before that. And then I would like to see Danny not believe him. Not because John said it, but basically her being like, like, you know, you understand what's happening. Sansa doesn't like me. Bran and Sam are your brother and your best friend. They're trying to undermine me up here in the north. It's like they're basically not accepting the fact that John is telling the truth because she doesn't believe Bran and Sam. Cue in our boy Howlin' Reed. Comes up and corroborates the story, tells Danny, and as an unbiased person who has no ties to anyone there, because he only had ties to Ned Stark, right? He could advise, tell Danny exactly what happened since he was there when they took out Arthur Dane and Gerald Hightower at the Tower of Joy. And he was there. Obviously, Ned Stark's got to carry Jon Snow or Aegon Targaryen down the steps. And what do you think Halloween's going to be like? Oh, cool. Nice fucking baby, man. Like, no. Like, of course, like, he's going to have to explain to, to uh, Howland Reed what happened. And so now having Howland Reed as a, like, he doesn't have any sort of bias, him tell her exactly what happened. So that way, number one, he plays a big role in revealing who John really is. And number two, we like, you know, he comes into battle for the Starks, you know, for his best friend's kids, so they survive. <laughs> Boom, we, we get taken care of where Holland Reed fits in, right? Now, what I would like to do talk about as well, too, now before the long night, instead of John telling Danny in the crypts who he is, John back in the crypts. Howland Reed going to John because remember what John and his father Ned Stark talked about at the end of season one when they split. Ned promised to tell John about his mother when they see each other again, right? And they never saw each other again because Ned died. Well, what better way to talk about John's mother than having your father's best friend tell you about it in the crypts while you're next to your mother that you now know is your mother, and have Howland Reed sit there and tell John about who Lyanna Stark was and how they had to keep it a secret and really like kind of go into depth about it and really kind of like take John under that wing and kind of explain to him who he is so John's not in the dark about you know his past because think about it his whole world got flipped upside down when Sam basically told him Ned Stark's not your father man you're not a bastard you're actually born by Rhaegar Targaryen and Lyanna Stark <laughs> like what no big deal yeah no big deal all cool right so like his whole world his head must have been spinning and to have Holland Reed explain that to him as, like, you know, his father is not able to, you know, if I have a best friend, if I have a child, you know, and I've got a best friend that I trust and I can't ex disclose something because I die, I, what I would want, I'd want my best friend to be able to tell exactly we, I would have what I would have wanted to, right? So that's what I would have liked to see there. Now, uh, I would like to see... This, this is where we start the, the beginning of the long night. So instead of that conflict where Danny tells John and they're kind of like 
at each other. You know, she's obviously super uncomfortable with the situation. I would have liked him to kind of get a sense of peace with the fact that he is Aegon Targaryen the sixth right there. Okay. Then all of a sudden the bells ring and they're getting ready to stand for the long night. Now, I would have liked to see Daenerys instead of getting mad at Jon Snow and like, you know, because they remember like they were getting frosty with each other when it was time to fight, like he was ready to fight alongside her and she was kind of throwing shade and attitude his way. Her be able to like accept it a little bit more because he knows she, he's not just saying that from his brother and his best friend, like but there's someone else who corroborated that story. So they're able to kind of get along in a better way to start out this big battle. Now, bro, what I really like to see, and this is going to throw you for something right here. Remember, because you were talking about how you thought Cersei influenced Robert to kill Lady. Well, remember the, the wolf that she was supposed to kill was Nymeria, but uh, Arya got Nymeria to run away. I would have liked to see Nymeria return with a pack of dire wolves and run alongside Ghost. That would be awesome. Dude, right? That would have been Nymeria badass, shows man. up at the very that end of the long badass. night and has yeah. Ghost next to her and them as like the last surviving wolves of the Stark like, you know, bloodline. They have a like a pack of dire wolves and they all just attack the like instead of the Dothraki being the first ones out there, it be the Dothraki and the dire wolves like kind of intersected with each other to attack the army of the dead. It would have even kind of like foreshadowed like Arya and John are like always in this together. connected. Yes, hundred yeah, percent. That's, awesome. that's it's good stuff. So cool, right? <laughs> so that's what I like. So when that whole horn sounds and they're ready to go, so the Dothraki like you know Melisandre says her chance, lights the their their. A rocks on fire, which is the curved sword. Akios, osos, musos. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> yeah. So I would have really, really liked to see that happen and them go out like, you know, as, as the dire wolves fighting with the Dothraki because it's almost like they're all savages, right? Wolves are wild animals and Dothraki are kind of seen as savage wild animals to attack this army of the dead. Now, don't get me wrong. I still would have liked to see what ended up happening with them. All of a sudden, they get like disappeared and engulfed in darkness and like the Dothraki running back you know as it kind of happened in the show i'm okay with the majority of how the long night happened so i'll keep a lot of what they did there cool because i'm good with it right so now as this is as the battle is raging on right you know john and daenerys fly in the dragons they start burning like as they see that their front lines are getting smashed you know the dothraki had to retreat there's barely any dothraki left which of something i had a problem with uh, you know, that I talked about after the bells, them just saying, oh, only half of all of our people are gone. Bro, it was in that long night, it looked like you had six Dothraki left total. Yeah. Like, that's it. get the fuck out of my face. That's like, it. And you, had, yeah. you look like you had like 50 unsullied, maybe. That's like, it. not half. Get out of my face. So, <laughs> I would have liked to see, you know, while they go and burn the, the lines there. Yeah, they they start doing their formations, backing up the just waves and waves of the army of the dead attacking and attacking, and kind of getting it to the point where they they really showed it over the lines, right? Mm -hmm. So they get over the battlements of Winterfell, and then kind of like exactly how everything happened. You have the Hound doing his like scared shit. Beric like, hey, listen, does it look like she's given up? No, and like you see, we're seeing Arya. I'd like to see that whole scene because I thought that barrel roll down the mm -hmm. fucking bodies yeah. was the coolest thing I ever saw in the long night, right? So I'm totally cool with all this happening while Bran is over in the godswood as planned because he was bait for the Night King. Remember those marks on his wrist? That let the Night King know where he is at all times. So now, not only do you have Theon guarding you, you have Mira Reed guarding you as well, as well as Alice Carr Stark, who was the one guarding him alongside Theon, and the rest of like her retinue, how they, they were just outside there uh, surrounding him, right? Right. So as this battle's going on, and it's looking bleaker and bleaker for the side of the living, like it did in the real show. I would have loved to see that part where, you know, Arya kind of gets like trapped, but Beric and the Hound save her ass. And then Beric kind of goes down the same sort of way. I'm okay with how that mm -hmm. happened. Keep it the same. I like it. Beric goes on down by a, like a like swarm of dead people just stabbing him. Remember, he's like holding against the wall and he's just getting attacked and like stabbed and like cracked from the side. And like they finally get him into the room and they shut it. Right now, this is what I would like to see. Because guess who? Remember who was in that room? 
Melisandre, right? Right. I was going to wait for you to say it. So, you're rewrite. Yeah, <laughs> right. So Melisandre's in that room. And she makes that important thing there. Like, you know, he served his purpose. Talking about Beric. You know, you got, he got you to this part. Remember, you know, because... Brown eyes, green eyes, blue right, eyes. Right, because Arya says that, you know, you said we'd meet again. And Melisandre says, yeah, and here we are at the end of the world. Said she I said, shut eyes forever. He said, he said I shut <laughs> eyes forever, too. She's like, yeah, but, you know, brown eyes, green eyes, and blue eyes. And so the one thing I wanted to talk about, and this is the exact, this is the exact quote that she said. Before we even get to this part, remember this. Remember when uh, Sir Davos allowed Melisandre to walk into Winterfell. He ran up to her. And what did Melisandre say? He says, she says, uh, oh, what, I just had it here. When Sir Davos. There it is. Here, I got, I got it. No, so I, I got it. Here it is. Mm-hmm. So when Sir Davos like runs up to her, she goes, there is no need to execute me, Sir Davos. Mm-hmm. I'll be dead before the dawn. Now, remember the prophecy, the prophecy the prince that was promised will bring the dawn. So bear with me here, guys. Instead of Melisandre at the end of the long night walking out and just disappearing into dust, this is what I would like to see happen. She grabs Arya's hand that has the cat's paw dagger in it, uses every part of her energy left in her magic uh, to, to where she like gives out her life's energy basically to turn the cat's paw dagger into... The, the sword light bringer basically because the guess what it was be, it is before the dawn she's going to bring the dawn right so she was like, i'll be dead before the dawn she gives out all her life's energy into her magic where she turns that blade into because now it's light bringer it's dragon glass and it's valyrian steel that's pretty badass all in that's one a pretty fucking- awesome <laughs> idea that's pretty and so cool. then she just collapses dead right as you see the blade glowing and the heat emanating you see like almost like the what do you call it the fog like not the fog but like the steam the steam the coming steam. off of, yeah. of the blade and you just see it glowing in the light and she's dead there and she fulfills her own prophecy I'll be dead before the dawn that's Isn't awesome now that's really good Arya's got Lightbringer but it's not what you think of in a sword it's the cat's paw dagger, which has been a big, important piece throughout the entire series of Game of Thrones ever since someone tried to kill Bran with this dagger, right? So, anyways, this battle's still commencing, right? The biggest thing, you know, Danny gets knocked off. Uh, you know, John like gets knocked off Rhaegal. I almost said Rhaegar. Gets knocked off Rhaegal, <laughs> right? I would love to see John get knocked off Rhaegal. He chases the Night King. The Night King raises the dead, and he's got to basically fight his way through. So him and the Night King never had that showdown is what it shows in the show. I'm okay with that right here. Follow me here, guys. This is going to be great. So now remember when Danny blows down that big old dragon fire on the Night King. Night King unscathed. Doesn't bother him at all. Cool. No problem. I'm, I'm good with that. But remember when all the like when she lands, like all the uh, army of the dead was like dragging up on her dragon. He the dragon is trying to shake them off, and when he shakes them off, she goes flying off the back, and that's when they go to attack her. And who comes to her aid? Sir Jorah. That's but awesome. Remember this. Well, I mean that's that's exactly what happened. That's not my mm-hmm. own thing. I can't take credit for that. Yeah. But what I will take credit for is this next part. When he raises the army, like when he raises the dead, who else gets raised from the dead? Everyone in the crypts. All the crypts in there. Who's in the crypts? We got Sansa. We got Tyrion. We got Varys. We got Missande. We got all these people. Crypts are fucked. The crypts, like, right? And so all the dead start coming out of the crypts. I would have loved to see Grey Worm understand what was happening and him go down to the crypts and fight off as many of the dead singularly by himself to save Missandei. Because guys, no one important, like That's it was awesome. basically, it That's was great. It was I basically it. like this. In the in what happened in the show, nobody in the crypts died that was important. Not one. It was not, it was basically like here, there are some people that are gonna be brought back to the dead that are in the, the, the tombs of the Starks. Cool, awesome. But like, Tyrion was never in danger. Sansa, Missandei, none of them like ever seen like oh they're, they're gonna die here. 
right? So I would have liked them to see like, yo, know, they, they pin Miss Sande like real close, like that she's about to die. And then you just see Grey Worm just like for the love of his life, just hacking and mowing these people in the crypts down by himself, right? And while he's fighting them down in the crypts, we have that huge moment with like the giant and Liana Mormont. I almost said Liana Stark. Liana, <laughs> Liana Mormont, that happens just the way it happened. That was beautiful. Loved it. Awesome. I guess technically that could happen. Comes back from the crypts. Yeah, <laughs> yeah right? I'm just kidding. <laughs> so I, I really liked to see that like the, the the whole giant thing. I'm happy with the way Ed Tollett died saving Sam. Like it, it like I, I'm okay with that the, that death. Now after Liana Mormont gets crushed by the giant's hand, but she's got enough energy to poke the the Valyrian or the dragon glass dagger into the giant's eye, and the giant collapses and she dies. Who are we down now? Melisandre's dead like she was in the original. Beric's dead like he was in the original. Ed Tollett's dead like he was in the original, right? So we've got three that are dead right now. Now, as this is going on, remember what I said. Jorah is protecting Danny, and he's doing his best, but ultimately he falls. He dies. And what's going on while Jon's fighting the army of the dead? The Night King and his generals are walking to the Godswood, okay? Now, like I said, Theon, he's holding his own. He does a badass job. But Theon, ultimately, we all know he's not going to be the one to save Bran. And just along with Mira, right? We have House Reed there. Howland's just fighting alongside maybe Jamie and Brienne like they were on the ramparts. Totally cool with that. But we see Theon, you know, run at the Night King and die just the way he died. Now Theon's dead. Like to see everyone in that gods would die. Mira gets killed in service to Bran, just like her brother Jojen, making a full circle moment there. Mm -hmm. Now, Howland Reed has no heirs, right? But at the end of the day, how beautiful is that, that like her brother died saving Bran in the beginning, and then she died saving him at the end. Beautiful full circle yeah, moment there. that's great. An additional mm -hmm. death there that would have been great, because in the long night, like I said, my issue with it, it was too predictable who died. So right now, you have an additional death of Mira that wasn't in the original. She dies. You know, the Night King gets to, you know, gets kind of gets, starts walking up to Bran or whatever. But now we go back down to the crypts. And you just see Grey Worm doing his best, fighting them all off, but getting overrun. There's just too many, and he's the only warrior down there who thought to go down to save the people that were in the crypts where the bunch of dead motherfuckers were laying to rest. And he's like almost like that Barristan Selmy moment back when the Sons of the Harpies just overran him. He's trying as best that he can, but he's taking blow after blow. But he's he's got his back up, and Masande's not being touched, and he's he's saving the love of his life. Now, he's still kind of breathing same way kind of Jorah Morma is with Danny. Like he's obviously gonna die because he's taking so many blows, but he's making sure that no one's getting to Danny. That ex same exact thing, that kind of love that you saw Joy have for Danny, we see Grey Room have that from Asande, and they're holding it to the very, very bitter end, right? Now, it's all about to come to a head here, because now we've got the the Night King. Grabs his ice sword. Now in the in the original, he didn't even get to grab it before Arya jumped in like that whole Arya thing happened. In my rewrite here, what I would have liked to see is the Night King grab his ice sword, swing it down on Bran now that they're all dead, right? Theon's dead, Mira's dead, there's no one protecting Bran, Bran's sitting in his wheelchair all alone. But as this like as the Night King grabs his like uh his sword and swings down, it cuts over to because remember what happened John couldn't get to Bran because why? Viserion, the ice dragon, was in his way blowing fire. What I would have liked to see here, Rhaegal come out of nowhere and spear the ice dragon and just have them tumble, tumble, badass. roll into a <laughs> big old brawl between dead Viserion and Rhaegal, leaving the opportunity for John to run through the godswood just to get there in time. And so then it cuts back to the Ice King or the Night King throwing down the ice sword and all of a sudden you hear like a, like John's like ah like that little noise he makes and then you see like Longclaw stop the Ice King's sword inches from Bran's head. Right? How does this make sense again? Remember John couldn't get to Bran because Viserion was blocking the way. Now Rhaegal for some reason was out like diddling himself in the in the real world like or in the real episode 
like why didn't he never make a comeback here? It would have been amazing to see Rhaegar take out Rhaegal take out Viserion and have them do a little dragon battle, leaving the path clear for John to get to Bran in time. Now, back to this. John stops that blade, and then the Night King and John have that epic, glorious, amazing sword battle that we deserved as a fan base. These guys have been facing off for years. Remember at Hard Home, they stared each other down. Uh, this has been coming for a long time. I would love this badass sword fight. Bang, 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 bang. Even as fuck. Like, like no one's getting the upper hand on each other. But the problem is, the dead never tire, and humans do. And eventually, John puts on the performance of his life, but it's not enough. And the Ice King eventually disarms him and like boots him in the chest, kicks him to the ground. And then John, you know, now Longclaw is far away from John because he's disarmed. He's got nothing. And now that he's not a threat anymore, the Night King doesn't even give a shit about him. Turns back around to Bran to make sure his job's done before you know the end of humanity begins. So now you, we get this feeling like, yo, our hero, our guy, John, who is like one of the best swordsmen in, in Westeros. Remember, Ramsay said, the way the people in the North talk about you, you're the greatest swordsman that ever lived. Well, our quote unquote greatest swordsman that ever lived just lost. You're feeling desolate. You're like, fuck, they're going to fuck us over like the Red Wedding. We're going to be screwed. John just got his ass kicked. And then the Night King goes down to swing on Bran again. And this time, Arya happens. Now, I'm okay with it happening just the way it happened in the, in the show. She comes down with the, the, um, the original dragon glass thing here. I'm sorry, the cat's paw dagger. Grabs her by the neck and grabs her by the wrist. Now, keep in mind, it's now, quote unquote, Lightbringer. It's a glowing, heating uh, blade. And also, it's dragon glass and Valyrian steel. She drops it down, catches it with her other hand, and puts it in his heart. And boom, he dies. I would have liked that a lot more because it would have got us to the brink of like, fuck, we are really going to lose this. She saves a day just like she did so she can still be that big protagonist. I'm totally okay with that. But we needed that Jon Snow sword fight and we needed it to have him lose to really feel like, oh my goodness, all hope is lost. Now, now that he died, all the rest of the army of the dead drops too. And just like it happened, Jorah dies falls in his arms but now down in the crypts gray worm almost almost identically at the same time you see like jorah fall down into danny's arms maybe gray worm it's like a cut scene back and forth between the two how similar it is because of the love they had for each other was very very same and then you see great gray worm he leaves this world he dies protecting the woman that he loved okay so let's let's chalk this up now we've got ed dying just like he did regularly. We got Beric Dundarin dying the way he did. We have Melisandre dying better because instead of just walking out like for no reason and just turning to dust, she died giving her life to bring the prophecy that she prophesized to reality. Okay? Then on top of that, we've got uh, we've got Grey Worm that died, Theon that died, Mira that died. Right? So we've got these additional people that brought so much more like angst like like it's 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 almost like what the terror would feel like losing a bunch of really main key people all right because like i said the, the ones before it was very very predictable who was going to live and who was going to die now you add gray worm to the death you add mira to the death like those are two people that you wouldn't think about right and what does this do now as well this is another person that Danny loses to get her closer and closer to the edge of flipping that switch of becoming the Mad Queen. Okay? And keep in mind, she's still in the north, so now all she really has is Missandei. Her and Sansa are at stupid odds, like before the whole night, like the long night happens here. So all this is a big deal. Okay? Anyways, the long night ends. You know, Arya's the one that brought the dawn. Lightbringer and it actually ended up being a dagger rather than a sword, but at least it's better than just not including it at all. Okay. Now we get to the banquet. Obviously, there's no Starbucks cup in my rewrite. <laughs> so we we get we get to the banquet. Everything kind of very similar. Danny offers uh, Gendry to be um, 
Gendry Baratheon gives him the title Lord of Storms and everything kind of happens the way it's supposed to now the thing that I have that's a little bit different is because all of these people are cheering and praising John because it, keep in mind in the Northerners eyes in the army's eyes it's almost like Daenerys didn't do anything because she was being protected by Jorah while John gave his life getting through the army of the dead was able to get past the fucking dragon and was able to go like toe to toe with the Night King even though he lost like dude, this guy like his his like star power is even better now right because his star power they all thought was cool that he was even riding the dragon he didn't even get a chance to fight the Night King in the real version imagine if he had the opportunity like to save Bran and do all that shit like his star power would have been through the roof but that to that detriment though like to his to his benefit is to Daener- Daenerys's detriment because now they're looking at her like what the fuck did you do Mm-hmm. John was riding dragons, blowing people down with fire too. On top of that, he was able to get there, almost save Bran, almost save everybody, get beat, but hold enough time for someone to get there to stop him. Danny, what did you do? Oh, you were there getting protected by Jorah. Awesome. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, yeah. on top of that, you know, before we get to that banquet, I totally forgot about this part here. When they lay all the, the dead to the rest in the pyres, like having Howland be the one to set the fire on to Mira and having Missandei be the one to set the fire on a Grey Worm, kind of like how we saw um, John set it to Lady Mormont and how we saw Sam set it to Ed right. and how we saw, um, uh, what's her face, Danny set it to Jorah. Now we see those extra two and we feel even more deeply for them, you know, as, as, uh, as an audience. So, anyways... Uh, we get we get through that banquet. You know, people start you know having their fun or whatever you want to call it. You know, the whole Jamie and Brienne thing happens the same way it happens in, um, in in how it really did in the show. I'm okay with that. That works for me. Now, am I annoyed about like his arc and how it turned around? Yes, but it's going to help me with my rewrite and how I have him exiting <laughs> an ice and fire. <laughs> right. So now. What I have happening is they they talk about how they're going to be bringing their their armies down. Well, I guess Danny does that same thing where she tries to get with John, and John's kind of like pulls her away, you know. And I wish, you know, I so I swear everyone to silence, you know. I wish I didn't know what I, you know, what I know. I was happy, and I was until I saw them with you, you know. You like they they love you, like you know. I've had that before, just never on this side of the sea, right? So all that's the same. So let's just go through to where things will start to change a little bit. So all that's the same. They they make plans to go down to Dragonstone. Then John goes in the Northern Army. Sansa still tries to um, go through with like, no, we gotta ha- let them rest. And like, Danny shuts her ass down. John shuts her ass down. Then Sansa and Arya talk with John and the gods. What John tells them, Arya, I'm sorry, Sansa goes ahead and spills the beans because that's you know what she's going to do anyway so that's all the same now when we get down to this part here they're they're sailing the dragonstone they're happy they're alive now the reason like now it's an even bigger reason why john couldn't ride Rhaegal because Rhaegal is really really wounded from Mm -hmm. his battle with the dead viserion right so now he's able to fly but he's kind of like he's not as aware he's sluggish he's wounded he's sore so now, when Euron Greyjoy catches them off guard, it's more realistic that he's able to put three pinpoint scorpions on him because he's already hurt as it is. Mm-hmm. So boom, all of a sudden, same thing sort of happens. Uh, you know, Missande, she's on top of the ship. She's heartbroken. She's standing there, like, you know, just like, you know, walking off the ship. Like, like she's almost the way Danny was when what happened to Missande happens. Right. Like, she's just distraught. Then all of a sudden, you know, the same thing. Their boats get attacked. Boom. Like, Rhaegal gets hit out of the sky. But now it makes it more swallowable that this dragon was able to be hit because it was wounded. It wasn't paying attention. It was just trying to fly to, like, it was giving so much effort to even be in the air. And then all of a sudden you weren't paying attention. And boom, boom, boom. Those scorpions hit him. And now Rhaegal dies. Just the way he did. But the difference is he was super wounded, making it more realistic to how... Euron could go three for three. Right. Right? Now, they take they take Missande captive. Same sort of deal. Now, the issue is, Grey Worm's not there to have a whole mm-hmm. meltdown about it. And so, same sort of thing happens here. This is where it's going to get really fun for you, bro. <laughs> same, same sort of thing happens here where 
they are in this room and uh, not, not, not quite yet. I got ahead of myself. So they, they are wondering how they're going to parlay and meet with Cersei and bring terms to them. Like the same sort of thing. Like, oh, well, you know, uh, this, the meeting with Cersei won't stop a bloodshed, but maybe they should see that Daenerys Stormborn tried everything that she possibly could to avoid bloodshed and they know who to blame when the sky falls down on them. Same mm-hmm. deal. Awesome. That works right. for me. Yeah. Now, towards the end, like the end of this episode of Last of the Starks, they all go to meet uh, Cersei like they did. Same sort of interaction. Only difference, Grey Worm's not there. Okay? And then, same, they, they give each other the same terms. Wasn't accepted. Cersei says, any last words to Missande? Missande says the same thing to Jakaris, hoping for some rescue. Doesn't happen. Sir Gregor cuts her head off, removes it from her shoulders, right in front of Daenerys. What does this do? Number one, it's beautiful poetry because now Missandei and Grey Worm are both dead. They can be together in the afterlife, right? Daenerys just saw her last closest friend and ally that she brought from Essos that was there from her from the start die again. Now she has zero people that she trusts fully. Grey Worm's dead. Jorah's dead. Two dragons are dead. Missandei is dead. She's got, like, at this point, she's got nothing. Add that to the point where she snaps makes it easier for you to believe that she's going to snap that fast because she, now she now keep thinking about this. The problem with Grey Worm dying, who's going to lead the Unsullied army? There's no one to lead the Unsullied army. No one speaks the language outside. So she's got to figure out which one of these Unsullied am I going to be like, okay, you're the new leader. Here you go. Right? So she's got to worry about that. But before she can worry about that, her best friend gets taken captive. Now she tries to go negotiate for her release. Negotiations go south, loses her best friend's life. So now we get into quote unquote the bells. And problem here is that everyone's gone on Daenerys' side. So Varys tries because he knows what's going to happen. Same sort of deal, like I mentioned before. He tries to poison her, you know, with maybe like the stones in his rings or whatever it was that he did try to poison her with, with Martha, where he says, you know, what have I always told you? And she says, the greater the risk, the greater the reward. And when Danny won't eat, tries to feed her, tries to poison her, doesn't work. You know, she, he goes up to John when he arrives finally at Dragonstone, tries to convince him to make a push for the like the Iron Throne, doesn't accept it. Like, same sort of deal. Now, this is where it's going to get a little bit interesting. Because now they're in this room where in, instead of Grey Worm being there and giving her Masande's collar, it's just Daenerys alone holding Masande's collar in this room with the fire. Mm-hmm. And like she's like 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 you can see like she's cried herself so out that no more tears are coming out, but like you know she's just in solemn mourning, and then right before Jon Snow comes in and walks in, she throws the collar into the fire, and Jon walks in and this is like a little bright spot for her. Hey, this is the guy I love, you know. And then so the same sort of thing happens like you know, uh, you know your your sister killed you know Varys as much as I did. You know she's plotting against us. She wants to see me removed and you on the Iron Throne. And, you know, John's like, well, I'll refuse, you know, <laughs> I'll re- refuse. I'll refuse. Yeah. <laughs> and it doesn't matter what you want, you know. <clears throat> You're my queen. <laughs> exactly. Back on that shit. And she goes, I don't have love here. I, I you know far more people love you than love me. I don't have love here. I only have fear. And then John says, well, you'll always be my queen. And then she replies, um, was that all I am to you? Is your queen? And they start kissing again. And then just like in the regular show, she pull, he pulls away and she realizes he, he's just not into it because they're related and like all the shit that's going on. So then she does the same thing and whispers, all right, then let it be fear. And John walks off. But then in the background, you hear a voice that says, well, things have changed for you a lot since you left Marine. And out of the shadows, you see Dario Naharis with a sack in his hand. No oh, shit. <laughs> in, in my rewrite, Dario Naharis infiltrates. Slavist. He infiltrates the Golden Company that came over to battle for Cersei. He infiltrates them himself. And he brings her, just like he did, a full circle moment. Remember, the original Dario Naharis brought Danny the heads of the other captains to prove his loyalty and love for her. He brings her the head of Harry Strickland the leader of the Golden Company. 
And so That's now, awesome. dude, it's, it's badass because he makes his grand entrance out of nowhere. She wasn't expecting it. We weren't expecting it. He was able to get into the Golden Company. He's that sly, sneaky guy who's just a badass. He's like he's like the Essos version of Braun, right? So now, now we've got this weird uh, dynamic going because... He, she knows Dario loves her unconditionally. She's starting to feel like John's pulling away from her. Now we've got this weird love triangle. We've got John, Danny, and Dario. Wild love triangle, right? So, from the love triangle here, it's going to come up to be a real big point. Because now, guess what? Now that she's got Dario, she can forgive him for abandoning his post in in Marine because she lost like like what I would have in my rewrite she lost the majority of the army as it was shown in the long night it wasn't just half like she's down to like barely reserves of like what she's got left but now she's got someone that can command the unsullied because they've worked with Dario before and he speaks the language so now she's got not only a love interest but a commander that can take Grey Worm's place so it came full circle we get an answer about what happened to Dario Naharis and it comes in perfectly. Now, what would happen here is what I would say is this is the start. You know, she kind of goes in the whole thing and talks about, you know, instead of Grey Worm tells Dario, uh, you know, be in position. You'll know when it's time. And Tyrion, like, begs for her to, like, reconsider if the bells, you know, stop the attack. If the bells ring, stop the attack. Whatever. So, now, on, on the side, you've got... You've got John, Darian Harris, the Unsullied, the Dothraki, and all the Northmen that are going to fight against the Golden Company. Now, the Golden Company are now leaderless. Harry Strickland was their leader, but he's dead. Now they've got like a, a scattered army, which makes more sense as to why they were so useless in the, in the show. Because remember when Dan Daenerys was starting to blow shit down and she blew through the Black End? So she, what she did, and I'm okay with this the same way, she blows through the, the, um, the Greyjoy fleet in Blackwater Bay. No issue there. Like Euron has to jump from it just to survive. She destroys all them. She goes back in, destroys the back wall, and then that army just attacks the Golden Company and, and just blows through them like a hot knife through butter. Then having the same sort of deal, even though she's got less people, they're devoted to her cause and they're better skilled warriors because now the their people doesn't they don't the Golden Company doesn't have a leader anymore because Darren Harris infiltrated and took him out. Badass. So, now, they start doing their whole fight through the streets. Daenerys is doing her thing, just blowing up the scorpions along the side. Love that. Totally in here. While this is happening, we see what happens with Jaime. He goes through the back way, kind of going through the tunnels, trying to find Cersei as, like, the stuff's going down, right? And then you have that big interaction with Euron and Jaime and Euron fight. And I'm totally cool with what happens there. Like, how it happened in the show. Euron stabs him fatally. Jamie was able to somehow get up there and, and kill Euron first, but he suffered two mortal wounds. Now, before like we get farther into Jamie there, we go back to where they basically destroyed all the armies there and then they have the opportunity to ring the bells. They ring the bells. Daenerys even more madder now because she's lost Grey Worm, Missandei, Jorah, two dragons, everyone she's ever loaned a whole deer at all. She's got no one from Essos outside of Darian O'Harris, who she doesn't even really love, but she'll accept him at this point because that's all she's got left, right? She mows, doesn't even think about it, just mows through King's Land in the same exact way that she did and just starts burning shit down. Now, and as we go into Arya and the Hound, as they make their way through up there, I would have liked to see the same sort of thing, like the Hound, they're, they're, they're up in the map room, right? Before he goes up to confront them, and he tells, like, Arya, hey, you think you want revenge, you know, you want to be like me? I want revenge my whole life. Like, you come with me, you die here. I like that. And I have yeah. Arya, quote-unquote, accept it. They, since she goes, Sandor, thank you, then walks off. But instead of her just walking away like we saw... She goes down to the tunnels instead of going up through there. So now you have the Clegane Bowl happen. I'm cool with how it happened. The only thing I'm not cool with was the way that the mountain looked. He looked like a zombie Varus. He had no beard all of a sudden, no <laughs> hair on his head. Yeah. Made no sense the way he looked. And I was telling Chase, I do believe the better 
of the act the best actor for the mountain was conan stevens which is the one in, in season one keep in mind this clegane bowl actually happened a little bit on a small scale in season one at the tournament of the hand where the mountain was going to kill laura sir loris tyrell and then the hound stepped in and they had a cool little sword duel and it was awesome and then robert Brathian had to like shout for them to stop he cut off the head of the horse. Yeah, he cut off the head of the horse yeah, like one swing. Badass. So that was awesome. he was a better. He won because the reason why I thought he was better is he actually looked like like, like Sandor Clegane. They, they you could yeah. tell it. They could possibly he be did. brothers. Where yeah, Hapford, like Julius, uh, Bjornsson doesn't really look like uh, like what's his name, Rory something that who plays the Hound. Yeah. Anyways, so they have their little bowl there that he kills Kyburn. Cersei goes down the map room, but instead of Jamie meeting her in the map room. She has to figure out how to get out, and she decides to go down to the tunnels, too. Now, what I would have liked to see here is that she gets down into the tunnels and sees that it's all blocked off, kind of like she did with Jamie in the show, but she's kind of by herself. And then she sees Jamie, like, staggering and coming up to her, and she's like, oh, my goodness, you know, and they have that moment. They have this little moment where they, they're holding and embracing each other. And then... Cersei starts begging for her life like she did in this in the show where she's like I don't want to die Jamie please I don't want to die don't let me die here and I would love to see Jamie look at her in the face and say when you play the game of thrones you either win or you die and have him rip the face off oh, and it's shit, and it's dude. Arya oh, shit. and Arya That's cuts bad. her throat That's so awesome. she exacts revenge and and actually fulfills what she's been telling everyone she's going to do kill the queen since season 1 she's been trying to kill the queen to kill mm-hmm. Cersei kill remember the like that was with awesome. uh that is badass yeah, yeah with, that is badass with um, what's his face Ed Sheeran like I'm going to kill mm-hmm. the queen like he's been on the, she's been on the way to kill the queen forever and she never got to fulfill that in the show and that's how I would have loved it cuz now guess what you get uh, another faceless man like uh and then so but before that happens before he, she cuts it we get a cut scene back to Arya going up the tunnels and finding Jamie dead on the ground because of the mortal wounds that Euron dealt him. Jamie was never able to get back into the arms of the woman that he loved, which is a great fucking way to end his arc for being a little bitch and dis- like and, and dissing Brienne. Yeah. So he never was able to get back to Cersei. Never. He, he dies never being able to get back to the woman he loves. So she finds him dead on the ground, takes his face, and then it cuts back to that scene. And then her, her saying, when you play the Game of Thrones, you know, when you die, pulling the face of Jamie's face off, and it's Arya, and she cuts That's Cersei's awesome. that neck. That is badass. And the best part about this is, it's like, well, now what's Arya going to do is the place is collapsing on her. Remember in season one, when I was talking about Illyria Mopantis and uh, Barris talking in the dungeons, Arya had to find a way out of there to escape, and she did it through the sewers. So she knows that area, and she's small. So because of that time, and she knew how to escape from season one and tell her father about Varys and Illyrio's conversation, mm-hmm. That's awesome. she knows how to That's get the great. fuck out of the dungeon yeah. room. And so That's she's great. able to escape, so you don't have to worry about, like, well, does Arya get collapsed on? No, because she knows the room, and she knows how to escape it. That's awesome. So That's great. Yeah. What a love that there, right? That would have been perfect. Oh yeah, Man, that absolutely. Would have been a perfect ending. Really yeah. would have been awesome, and I'm not even done yet. <laughs> so, yeah. so, yeah. so now you see that there. Danny burns the whole place down. Cersei's dead, but then like you know, everyone's kind of in shock. And basically, now that everything's come down, it closes out episode five, the bells. Right now we get into episode six the very end of it what's the episode six name is it a game of thrones the iron throne, the iron throne. yeah the iron, the throne. iron throne so we get into the, the episode the iron throne and so now instead of Arya, like running through all this like like in the show like like in the show she's running through all of this actually before we get into that and when she escapes like through the sewers i would like to see like like her getting the, the the guy in the city kind of falling around her almost similar to how they had it but not so bad to you think that she was going to die there but for like her not to have a way out and then that white horse appear mm-hmm. just like it happened that's right but this time just like you know what was that quote in the bible let me see if i can find that um i i know it like like i wanted to say it by by quote because this is a really big point here um let's see revelations oh the one in revelation about the yeah. pale mare yeah yeah that's a good one um i had it written down in my notes from a couple of weeks ago actually um let's see so remember that this, this, then i looked 
and I saw a pale horse. Its rider's name. Wait, okay, hold on. Let me hit, let me hit the right thing here. I got to get the whole thing. I looked, and there before me was a pale horse. Its rider was named Death, and Hades followed close behind him. They were given power over a fourth of the earth to kill by sword, famine, and plague, and by the wild beasts of the earth. So that was that was um, the new international version. Let me see if I can find the King James version. So the King James version. And I, I looked, and then behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was death and hell followed with him and power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill a sword and a hunger and with death and with the beasts of the earth. So this is going to come into play here because now she hops on that white horse and rides out. But this is going to come into play later because now it fades out into season or episode six, the iron throne. The Northmen are upset and terrified and Sansa makes it a point to basically stand against Daenerys. Because if you're going to do that to King's Landing, how do we know that you're not going to do that to anyone that stands against you? And she's already had conflict, which is why that conflict is built up to the past here and, and throughout this past. So Daenerys go, goes through that big old speech, the one in Valyria and Dothraki to all of them. Yeah. And Arya is standing next to Jon, just like she is, like kind of beat up and bloody. And now... Like, like, you know, Tyrion does this thing where he throws his, like, hand of the king, or hand of the queen thing, and, like, you know, uh, yes, I, I freed my brother, and you slaughtered a city. Like, awesome. You're really cool. Right, you know, and then they take him into custody, but it's Darius and Harris that takes him instead of Greyworm, because oh, Greyworm's that's dead. Cool. Right? That's awesome. So, I love so that. So, Darius, uh, Dario takes him in there, holds Full him circle. custody. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so, now, what's pretty crazy is what's going to happen here is you know John goes to him and Tyrion tries to plead with him to do what's right again but John still doesn't quite get it until he goes to see Daenerys in the throne room where she's at where he's about you know he has to make this decision you know how he starts asking him questions about the world well instead of it being the world that it deems that John's got to save from her tyranny it basically means you know, she's ba- what she's going to have to do is start making it seem like you know your sister is is standing against me you know, you see what happens to those who oppose me. And so now, basically, what it's kind of come down to to John is he's got to choose between Sansa and Danny. Ooh, yeah. And so, like, so now, like, she's basically telling him that, like, she's going to take out Sansa and the Northmen. Because, like I said, the mm-hmm. Northmen are going to stand against her because, yeah. like, you just took out King's Landing. How do we know you're not going to do this? So we tried to stop, like, Daenerys' army, like, while we're doing it, and they were just hell-bent on killing everyone. Mm-hmm. So That's right. So now... Sansa is basically standing against Daenerys, and it's now Daenerys versus Sansa, and Jon's got to make a choice. Instead of it being like, oh, I got, I'm going to save the future world, it's like, do I choose my sister or my love? And now, what's going to happen here? Jon pulls out the knife, like he did in the show, goes to put it in her heart. But guess what? Who do we know that's a marksman at throwing a knife? Dario Dario Harris yeah, throws Dario a knife, Harris. catches John on the wrist before oh, John shit. before John can oh, shit. before oh, John can shit. put it into her heart. Fuck yeah! He drops the sword. Danny Fucking looks slay. at him, realizes John was a be- like so he he like, he drops the sword because or not the sword then the dagger he was about to put in Danny's heart because Dario hit him right on that nerve on the in the wrist that made him drop it. So so bad, dude. And so dude, Danny looks at him. Sick. Danny looks at John in shock as she bad. realizes her love of her life was about to kill her, and Dario just saved him. So she runs to the dragon to get on the dragon fly out, get on and all of a sudden, you know, Dario Harris has his Iraq and Jon Snow and Dario have a badass sword fight. That would be He's, sick. Like, one on one, Dario. Be- Versus Bad John for ass. the love of Danny. Oh, but dirty at its oh, finest. You think? You think that that's good? Ultimate dirty. You think that's oh, good? Yeah. Wait till you hear this part. Oh shit, Danny. Because now Danny is hell bent, and in, in, in my rewrite, she's gonna be like, all right, cool. Now all the fucking Northerners are fucked too. I'm burning everyone down. So she jumps on Jogon, and she goes to like fly off. But what she doesn't notice. Kind of like Arnold Schwarzenegger, like get to the chopper moment and jumping on and grabbing onto the helicopter. You see Arya with a spear jump onto one of the scales and hold it one handed. And Drogon's flying in the air while, while Arya's underneath and she can't even see it, right? So now D- 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 Dario and John are just having their badass sword fight. Bang, 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 bang. Like, I'm sorry to your boy, man, but I'm going to have John win this one just for, like, the, for the good of Westeros. John finally, 
Like it's 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 a real back and forth, almost as bad as it was, you know, for the Night King. But the thing is, is like Dario is human too, so he gets tired, and John just happens to be a little bit more trained, has better armor, and just he finally he gets the best of Dario and kills him. But like he he knows it's too late for him to stop Daenerys from destroying the rest of the Northerners and Sansa. Yeah. The good news is is who's there? Arya's there. Arya throws her spear. And with the dragon glass, like that's the dragon glass spear that Gendry made her, pierces Daenerys through the heart. Daenerys falls off Drogon. Daenerys, when Arya throws the spear through her, and she closes her eyes for the final time as she's dying, the prophecy comes true as she when she as she falls from Drogon in the air, as she closes her eyes, she's falling into the arms of Khal Drogo in death I like that and then Drogon starts sees her falling and he realizes someone else is on her and he starts like kind of doing some weird like alligator roll <laughs> shit and so so uh, while he's doing that like Arya's doing her best to stay on it and so now what she does is she takes out Lightbringer again the, the little the cat's paw dagger because she just speared Daenerys with the, the, uh, the uh, what's it called dragon glass spear and she stabs the back of Drogon's neck the problem is, is that when she does that, he drops from the sky and kind of turns over on his back, and now she's free falling in air, and as like his last ditch thing, just and incinerates Arya. Oh so shit! Now Dude, that's fucked up. So now, damn, Arya technically is death because she's killed the Night King, Cersei, Daenerys, and Drogon. Drogon's dead now, but so is Arya. She gave her life for her sister. After the person that she's had a conflict with since season one, she gave her life to save Sansa and the Northmen. And so now Arya, unfortunately, she dies. But this is exactly what I'm talking about. This is that Red Wedding type shit. Like, holy fuck, everyone's dying. Now, Dario's... This is insane. Dario's dead. John killed him. John now is off the hook for killing Daenerys because he didn't do it. Fucking Arya killed him. Can't punish Arya. Arya's dead. Drogon's dead. They're safe from the Targaryen reign and rule. Who are you gonna imprison? So now, now technically, the Unsullied have no leader. The Dothraki have no call. So they've got no one like that. They have any sort of power, like Grey Worm, to make a decision for anyone. They don't know what they're doing. So they all go. They like they just they like after that happens like they don't they they have nothing to do they see like the Westeros army you know like the the Prince of Dorne comes in with his like people finally he gets there a little bit late you know like they're like they are on John's side because Varys's letter I forgot to mention makes it out to Dorne and Dorne makes mm-hmm. the decision to side with John so now they arrive and it's basically going to either be what's left of the small amount of Unsullied and Dothraki against the Northern army. And the army of Dorne. If you remember, Dorne was the only civilization to hold off the dragons, and they didn't want any piece of that, and they decided to sail off. <laughs> yeah. Boom. So what? Badass. What ends up happening? John takes his rightful place as the king of Westeros. They all, they all are in it because he sacrificed everything, got no personal gain out of anything that happened. He doesn't get screwed over by getting sent to the fucking Night's Watch. He gets everything that he has coming to him for all the sacrifices he's made throughout his entire time in A Song of Ice and Fire. He's now the king. And guess what? Bran, he's the master of whisperers because he can see and hear everything being a raven. Sam is going to be the Grand Maester. Brienne, the master of war. Tyrion can be his hand. Like, this is how I have it ending up in my thing. And then he allows Sansa to have dominion over the north. Because they're related, they're brother and sister, even though he's technically Aegon Targaryen the sixth. A Targaryen takes the throne, but it's John who, again, the perfect balance, a Targaryen father and a Stark mother, meaning it's powerful and honorable at the same time. That was almost impeccable. Like that was uh that was badass. That um there were no flaws anywhere in that. That's so that good, that yeah. that kind of fulfills that. So, 
Um, a lot of what I was talking about it kind of fulfills a lot of the prophecies. It fills the Miriam Azdur mm-hmm. prophecy, the Azor High prophecy, the yeah. red eyes, green eyes. Or the, I'm sorry, the, blue, the brown eyes, the green eyes, and the blue eyes for sure because Cersei has green eyes. So it just I, I try to make, make everything come together in a crazy way, but also fulfill a lot of the, the holes too. Damn. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like Arya dying, but that's... That but is you wouldn't expect awesome. it. You wouldn't expect that you at all. You wouldn't expect it. That's a thing. And like that's makes that would have been that's a very Game awesome. of Thronesy thing to do. And it was very up down up. Like right when you thought it was down, that was badass, man. I I loved every minute of it. That yeah. was awesome. That was that was sick. That was some... <laughs> man. I almost wish I had my popcorn right here. For that <laughs> shit, man. I, I like the fact that, that Dario stops John from stabbing her with that throwing that knife because that was a that big was my knife favorite was like, part. That was, that was so dope, favorite. and as especially as a Dario fan, like people forget, you know, the knife. Remember, we were even talking about yeah. back in season five where he had like the naked woman on the handle, man. Mm-hmm. So they made a big point about that knife, and so it came back to play again. He threw it did that accurate precision, stopped fucking John from stabbing Danny. Danny goes on her her, her dragon to fuck up the rest of everybody else and Arya is like not today. That was, not ah, today. That was yeah, the, what do we man. say to the god of death? And that's why I said like, that's is, why man. she is the god of death. She that is. was awesome. That was badass, dude. That's a malice in the chalice, man. That was like badass. That, shit? that was badass. <sighs> um basically the big difference in mine. So, and I thought it was cool you brought up Dario and Harris and commanding the Unsullied because mine goes into a little bit of that, but it has nothing to do with Dario. I just left his ass in Marine. Yeah, and that's what I was very, down there. That's man. what I'm very sad because, like, guys, that's the part I told you I told uh, Chase about before we started today. I was like, "This is what happened, Dario." He's like, "Dude, why'd you tell me now? I would have loved to hear like, that for the first shit, time." Dude, like, yeah, shit. So, that was awesome. He didn't tell me the knife thing though, so I was stoked. That was yeah. awesome, man. But um, basically, mine. So it. it you know, see, episode one, I have the exact same pretty much. And episode two is uh, pretty much the exact same. You still have the tension with Sansa and Danny, but Jamie actually plays a big point in this. Um, so Jamie shows up over to Winterfell and he confesses just like he does in regards to Cersei's plan and everything that's going on. Well, um, a big piece of my rewrite is you'll find out in just a minute there's pieces of the plan that Cersei never told Jaime um so what happens is of course they take on you know the long night has come to Winterfell and they take on the long they take on you know the army of the dead with the night king the big differences that start out is so when you have that moment where the Night King and John are kind of going at it. And, you know, the Night King has the spear with Viserion, and Viserion's trying to bite on Rhaegal, right? Um, well, one thing that I would have changed just a little bit, right, is just like in Dance of Dragons that we talked about on previous episodes before. So when Damon fought Maester Aemon, they were basically in a lock, interlocked when they fought on the Battle of God's Eye and fell down. So what I would have done is they would have been interlocked almost where they were kind of attacking each other. How Viserion was still trying to get Rhaegal and then they fall. And when they fall, Rhaegal is a lot more hurt than he was, just like you were saying. But this is the moment because John is almost half beat because the the colliding is so much worse than what it was shown. Mm -hmm. You know, the Night King and John are really slow to get up here so he doesn't have a lot of time to be raising the dead like he did so this is that moment where you kind of get that square off between the night king and john what i have happening is john despite whatever he was thinking still gets his ass handed to him in the end so john winds up you know getting on the ground and the night king's about to stab him to his death and that's when you had Danny fly in with Drogon that shoots the fire. But of course, the fire doesn't do anything. So the Night King is basically like we were talking about fuck you then. You're a thorn in my side. Now that you have Danny here, I don't have time to deal with you. I'm not going to kill you now. I'm just going to do what I have to do. And he heads off to Bran. Then I have everything playing out exactly like it happened 
up to the point of where Arya killed the Night King in front of Bran. As the battle starts to go down, and then it goes into the last of the Starks where they're having the celebration. This is when it changes. <laughs> As so remember when I was saying there were parts that Cersei didn't tell Jamie. Mm-hmm. So what I have going on is coming in with a massive ass battalion. Not an entire army, but you know, almost like a same group that you had uh, in Last of the Starks when they were negotiating with Masunde for Danny. And keep in mind, the army is depleted at this point. Like it's no more half and half here in this rewrite. It is like you are were basically screwed. Yeah. If it wasn't That's for Arya, you yeah. were done. And who fucking comes in? You're on in the Lannister army. <laughs> 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 fucking shit. <laughs> And they're just like fucking everything up. They're just, you know, they're running through the city walls. So John's over here, you know, commanding everyone to get on the walls with the archers. And then you have Jorah that's taking the front fleet. And then Brienne and Jamie, just like they did before, they go and take the right and left flank. And they start commanding armies to take the right and left. Because everyone's scattered, right? Mm -hmm. So they can no longer command just one because their army is almost gone. Well, in this entire battle, what happens is, so you have Danny that still has Drogon. Rhaegal is still hurt, but basically she gets the army to start to retreat because she takes Drogon and just starts blowing them down. Right before the army retreats, the army is going towards the right flank so they can start climbing the walls and just killing everyone that's there. And of course, who does he fucking run into? Euron runs into Jamie and Brienne, and Jamie is taking on soldier after soldier after Lannister soldier, fighting against his own family, which is tearing him apart. As Tyrion is watching from the upper walls with the archers, because they just ran, they don't have time to get to the crypts at this point. And Brienne is taking him down with him. And then Euron comes from the left flank as Jamie's on the right, and Brienne starts fighting Euron. Well, who the fuck gets knocked down? Sorry, it's fucking Euron. He knocks the shit out of Brienne and just pushes her down and goes straight to Jamie. Jamie, still fighting a soldier, is taking on two people at once, and he can only use one hand, and Euron stabs him in the side. And as he's stabbing him... This is at Winterfell. At Winterfell. Okay. This is at Winterfell. Jamie goes down, and he goes down, and Euron... Uh, just kicks him down doesn't say anything and he's just staying there and then he's about to like stab him through his entire stomach and just starts yelling i fuck the queen <laughs> and right as he does brianne like stabs him and he falls to the ground for like two seconds she doesn't worry about euron she goes straight to jamie because her emotions to this point is all i care about is jamie and Jamie is just wheezing and <gasps> like can can't breathe. And as he's in Brienne's arms, fucking Euron pulls his ass up and starts walking away towards the army. Just walking away, almost like he did in King's Landing. And Jamie is in her arms. She doesn't even worry about it. And he passes away and dies. And it goes back to when earlier in the episodes and earlier in the books, you know, Jamie always talked about, I always wanted to die in my loved one's arms. So it shows he really always loved Brienne, despite his love for Cersei the whole time. Euron fucking escapes because she's too busy taking care of Jamie at this point to deal with him. So the army retreats with, you know, a half a battalion which is really you know like a hundred guys like despite the massive army they came in Drogon just fucked them up like that's just the way it is but they had basically nothing so you don't have time to go chase their ass down you focus on what you have so what they decide here despite the arguing that's already been going on and John's already told Danny about his lineage in episode 2 which I had almost exactly the same before the long night 
they decide they're going to go take refuge in Dragonstone because Cersei already knows where they're at. And if they come back again, they decide that there is then they decide there is no way that they can take another fleet because this isn't like where they had you know let's say we have half let's say we have all this shit back in where they were in dragonstone no it's like they literally have what they have left like we need to find a place to calm down for a while and and regroup try to find more allies and they go to dragonstone this is like three weeks later so time kind of lapses here for just a minute and you do have you do kind of have that moment with Tormund and he kind of says goodbye and all that stuff and Rhaegal's kind of recovered just enough where he could fly so you kind of have this moment where the whole separation between Sansa and Danny, and you still have Tyrion talking to Sansa because after what they just endured you know but this time it's better because it's like we need to come together for a greater cause at this point. Like we just got ransacked. So now it's not just about the throne. It's about it's about revenge at this point because you just took it out on us. Now you've just killed a bunch of the Northmen at the same time. So you have a little bit of that moment where I can almost come to an agreement with you. But it's not at the point of I'm just completely on your side. But I'm still going to support what you're doing. So, what they decide is all the armies are going to go to Dragonstone, and they're going to go ahead and take King's Landing from there. Why Yara, that's in command of the Iron Islands, is going to sail in from the other side, and then take them from the back. Because they're not even considering Yara, because she's been gone the entire time. Well... Mm -hmm. So as the next episode starts, so this would be generally Last of the Starks, and this is on my one season review here. Rhaegal's kind of recovered just enough to fly, so John's on him, and John's like, I'm going to go, you know, me and Danny are going to fly first. So you all take the ships, you all sail. Tyrion, Tyrion and Grey Worm, you take the first boat out with us with a few ships, Everyone else, you get there when you get there. Sansa, you get there when you get there. Arya, you get there when you get there. And then you have Danny, and you have Jon that's kind of sailing next to each other. But he's sailing next to Danny really to just protect her at this point. Because at this point, you have no loyalty. You don't know who's where. And as they're kind of watching out for each other, he's paying more attention to her. Guess who the fuck retreated to Dragonstone to grab fucking power? (laughs) Fucking Euron Greyjoy. And Rhaegal still isn't at the point he's fully recovered. He's going fucking three for three, knocks Rhaegal out, and then plummets to the ground. Doesn't kill Jon because he hits just the dragon because he's aiming just for Rhaegal. Plummets into the ocean. And Danny sees this with her own eyes. Instead of focusing on Danny, as Danny goes straight for Euron, taking out as many ships as she can. You still have those three or four ships that are there out of the 11 they had. What does Euron do? He's intellectual as fuck. He knows Danny's going to get hers. So she starts to pull away for a minute and circles around as she's trying to see what's happening with Jon. Rhaegal's dead. Rhaegal's done. Plummets into the ocean. You can see his body and his head floating as Jon is swimming to the shore. Euron commands his fleet to focus all the fleet to the two ships that are there with Tyrion and Grey Worm and everyone on it. (laughs) Takes them out, just like the show. Gone. Tyrion jumps off the ocean, jumps into the ocean. The ships are destroyed. Grey Worm goes into the ocean. As Danny's circling, she realizes what's happening and gets down on the beach. Grey Worm and Jon show up first on the beach. The beach already has the fucking army on it. Hmm. It's already ambushed. Like, they set the beach there on purpose. The boats were around the beach. They are not just leaving a fucking castle for no reason. The castle is already taken with Lannister soldiers at this moment. Tyrion, in the fucking ocean... Danny and lands 
at the very edge of the shore on the far left side. So that way she's the farthest away from Euron who's still on a fucking ship. And you have Lannister soldiers still charging her. Tyrion, smart, his boat was over towards the left, so he gets off first and is able to get over to the dragon where Danny was. Grey Worm, of course, is on the other boat that gets to the shore first and is taking out Lannister shoulder, soldiers mm-hmm. one by one as much as he can, taking captive. John, from where he was knocked off Rhaegal in the center of the ocean is too far back so it takes time to swim over to dragonstone island so he of course gets there last no ma- and we know he's not a fucking great <laughs> sim- swimmer from f- season fucking seven yeah danny has no choice but to leave because she's starting drogon's getting spears thrown at him he's screaming he's roaring danny's like i don't know what to fucking do Tyrion barely climbs on and they have to just circle above and leave. As she's leaving, she sees John crawl up to the shore where the Lannister soldiers just capture him with Grey, with Grey Worm. Next scene, Euron kind of circles him up in the middle. It would have been really funny to be like, oh, this is a gift for a queen, but it'd be very cliche, so yeah. I didn't do that. So what I have here is you're on with the Lannister soldiers he has. It's funny because I actually even put it in my notes. In the castle is the Golden Company. Yeah. So it's like you're double fucked at this <laughs> point. Like you have the Golden Company occupying the castle and the Lannister fleet all around you and all, on Dragonstone. He takes John. You have John and Grey Worm captive. Goes up to Grey Worm with the Lannister soldiers. <laughs> takes his axe out and cuts his head off. Shit. In front of John. And John is just standing there. Like, so stunned and so quick, you don't even know what to do. Like, you just. There is silence. It's complete shock in the episode. It's almost like the Red Wedding. And it's not over yet. He takes John, puts him in chains, and all you see to end that episode is a hundred Lannister soldiers walking with John and Euron, led by Euron, back to the ships to go back to King's Landing. Okay. So then you have the next episode. And at this point, you have uh, in the next episode, which is really what you would have as season five, like the bells, yep. uh, episode five of the bells. This is when you actually have Cersei that meets with Kyburn and finds out Bronn that set off to meet Tyrion and Jaime got there and found out what Euron did. So he was like, fuck that. I'm going back to King's Landing. Because Braun has always kind of been about himself. Yeah. So he just said, fuck that. And Jamie was already dead anyways. So what was the point? So he just fucking goes back and leaves. And goes back to King's Landing. Danny, Masunde, Tyrion, and Varys, and Arya. The Dothraki, the Northmen, and Sansa. All at once. Go to King's Landing with her. Takes time. But they were already on their way to Dragonstone. Go to King's Landing to discuss John's captive to try to get him back. And this is where you have it very similar at the moment. You have the Mountain. You have Kyburn. You have Cersei and the Lannister army along the wall. The only difference is Is there's John and not Missandei. It's John and not Missandei, but there's another difference here. There's a block in the center. And they're negotiating back and forth, and Tyrion gives that long-ass speech. Uh, You know, negotiating for John, Like, don't do this. And Sansa, you know, where you had that point where it was almost like a breaking point between Danny and her, 
and they got closer. This is what brings them to that point. They start to agree with each other because this is no longer about this is the war at this point. This is no longer about who's right, who's wrong, who wants to be independent, who wants to take the throne. This is for her damn brother. And she pulls John out. John doesn't say anything. He just kind of stares and you can see his eyes and his hair is pulled back and he's looking at Danny and he's looking at Arya and he stares at Sansa last and Sansa is trembling and it's more about Sansa at this point trying to get to her brother because she can't believe what's happening and Arya is just standing there and already knows what's about to happen. Cersei doesn't say do you have any last words or anything. She has Kyburn walk over in front of Tyrion where Kyburn has been says it always seems a little ironic doesn't it? And they cut off Jon's head in front of everybody. And that is what sets in the mad fucking queen. And so that's some full circle shit because you know Ned getting his head cut off in season one and then like if he's still he's still kind of raised by then he's like Ned's last son that could not that's not in a wheelchair that's some uh, <laughs> that's some full circle that's cool that's kind of cool yeah okay. um, like that. so <laughs> on top of now you have Grey Worm dead and you have John dead who's commanding the Unsullied well because of where they landed and how Danny fought off John, Jorah commands the Unsullied. Oh, so he has Jorah surviving the long night. I have Jorah okay. surviving. Yeah, so Jorah takes over because don't okay. forget, you know, he still speaks their tongue, just like how Masunde mm-hmm. said. Mm-hmm. You know, you speak their tongue, and he told them to lift their rats. Melisandre. Melisandre. I, I, make, Melisandre, the, I, make, Melisandre. I make the same mistake. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so click close. Um, <clears throat> well... Masande is so broken by the whole situation with Grey Worm that just happened and, and Danny's distraught. So you kind of have a little bit of what happened with the depression, but it's a different scenario. It's not about Rhaegal. That's sad, but it doesn't have an effect as what John had on her. And it's it kind of solved her problem too, because now she's got no threat to the Iron Throne. Yeah, no, no threat at all. And Masande is so broken, she sails to Noth by before herself. Before the war even Just starts. leaves. Yeah, before it starts. Like, I can't have any part of this anymore. Like, mm-hmm. I have to go. Like, the closer I get to King's Landing and just fighting Cersei, like, I don't have that power to get revenge. It's just, I'm just going to be more broken. And um, she leaves. Uh, just like she was saying before, you know, like... If that's what I wanted, she would give me a ship and send me on my own. And she did. She just said, Danny tells him Sunday, take it and go. Yeah. And that's it. Like, she's so depressed, she can only tell her two words, her own best friend, and tells her to go. So, sunday has gone. And then you have Sansa that really kind of becomes more of, this is what we need to do. Like, it, it, Danny is so depressed, it's not even more of about, I want revenge and I want the throne. It's like, I want the throne, but I'm just in complete mourning right now. Like, take a shot. Fuck you guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyways, but it's Sansa that's with Arya, and Arya kind of has that push with Sansa, and they're like, no, fuck this. Like, we're getting revenge for our brother here. So they go to King's Landing. Um, Arya and the Hound leave in the middle of the night, just like normal, just like the episode. Like She's like, I'm going to kill the queen first. Like, I- I'm going to do this. Um, Tyrion pleads with Sansa and Danny, you know, at the same time, and they're meeting in the war room. Don't destroy the city. And Sansa is kind of telling Danny, you know, we do need to negotiate at some point. But they're both at the point like, fuck it. Like, just blur and burn the shit down. Like, this is our brother. Like, it doesn't matter anymore. And it really goes to show, like, all, all negotiating for those two 
is off the table because yeah. now it's family and this is the person you loved. So they take everything they have left. They leave all of it from Winterfell, all the Northmen, all the Dothraki, all the Unsullied. And this is when you wind up seeing uh, in the actual, um, what do you call it? The tower, the keep thing? It wasn't the, the keep. keep. They were in the tower thing where Kyburn was talking to Cersei before. That's the Red Keep. The Red Keep. The Red okay, keep. gotcha. Yeah, that's where you actually see Euron. Okay. And then you see Kyburn and you see Cersei there. Euron, <laughs> smiling, sick motherfucker, looks at Cersei. And Cersei, you know, she is actually at this point. This is where you have a little bit of feelings for Cersei. Because you think maybe she's not a complete monster. And she starts debating, maybe I shouldn't have killed Jon. Because she starts to see, like, fuck. Like, I just had the whole fucking Stark house. All the Northmen is now turned on me, too. And Euron says, what is dead may never die. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And then this is when you have that moment where Sansa takes the Northmen in the front. Danny comes from the back, just like usual, but Euron's not in the fleet, so she just blows completely through the shit. Take a shot. And then they take it from the ass, <laughs> from the mouth, as you always say. And, you know, Arya is heading for Cersei with the mountain, or with the hound, and the hound is heading for the mountain. And this is when you kind of have that whole moment with the hound and the mountain. But remember when Kyburn walks down the stairs and he shoves Kyburn against the wall. Mm -hmm. So right before he tells Arya and Arya has that moment because keep in mind, this is still her brother. This isn't it. This is personal now. So it has even more of a meeting than this is the list I'm going to kill the queen. This is this is my brother. I want this to happen. And this is where this moment means even more. And the hound tells her, you go with me, you die here. And everything's collapsing because they just don't give a fuck anymore. And she says, Sandor, thank you. And just leaves because she realizes it's not worth it anymore. Like there's no, it is worth it. But if everything is going to be torn down with it. And that's when you start to have that moment where she meets up, you know, with the mother and the young daughter. Mm -hmm. And then you have Cersei and Kyburn that are walking down the stairs with the six guys. First, the hound takes out the six guys. The mountain shoves Kyburn against the wall. And then the hound stabs Cersei right through the chest. And she's okay. done. She dies down the stairs and that's it. <laughs> okay. That's fucking it. Okay. Um, so then you have that whole thing with... You have that whole thing with the mountain and the hound. And then they, they destroy the entire city of King's Landing. So, and this is, there's a a bit of a difference here in this moment, too. So, it's different in my seasons 1 through 10. And I'm going to tell you that in just a bit. Uh, We're doing the 1 through 10 next week, right? Yeah, 1 through 10 next week. Because that's next week. Okay. Yeah, so that's pretty cool. But so she she's gone. Okay. So the hound kind of takes that moment upon himself to take Arya's pledge. Is basically what that is. Um, so then, you know, the the place is destroyed. You have that moment with Arya, and you have the girl with the wooden horse, and they're burned down, and everything's gone. And then at that point, Arya is realizing, 
you know, she's not the queen we wanted. Like, these people don't deserve to die. Because she just had that moment with the hound. And that was that big pusher where, you know, this isn't worth it anymore. Like, it's personal, but there's no reason to take it out on all these people. And what happens is after Danny gives the big speech, you have Arya that uses the faces of the unsullied and she goes and winds up killing Danny. Okay. And then Drogon burns down the Iron Throne just like normal. And I was thinking about killing Arya. I'm just too biased, so I hmm. won't do it. <laughs> so he doesn't kill Arya, even though he should in this moment. And she takes Danny. And in the like in the last episode, what you were seeing that Samuel Tarly was saying last time I saw Drogon, who was on his way to Villa Well the theory is Volantis. And all you see is the very last episode, which is this is the one season one. This isn't seasons one through ten. You have Drogon drops Danny off in Volantis in the free cities and Kenvara walks up. The other red priestess. The other red priestess. And all you see is Danny open her eyes and it ends. Oh, at least she brings her back to life. Yeah. And that's my rewrite for one season. <clears throat> I don't I don't hate it. I, I would like to have seen uh, maybe for the next uh ones, I'd like to see like more of the prophecies coming into play, like being fulfilled, like the yeah. Lightbringer and the Zora High. Um that's one, all one. in the next one. Okay, the problem cool. is it's so smashed. It is. So yeah, I mean that was mine. It was difficult because it's there's so many unanswered questions. Which I have a lot of them in my seasons one through ten. I just feel like I was trying to mesh yeah. too much shit in there. So that's the best I could come up with for one season. Cool. So So yeah, guys, that was uh the rewrites according to us. I know I took the, the first part there, Chase you kind of finish it up you know I, I think that uh regardless of if you liked like which one made the most sense to you i think we can both agree that either one was at least more climatic than what we did see happen on screen so uh yeah i, I was happy with the way that we tackled it today man i don't know about you uh, i thought it was great i i really liked yours man that dario moment oh when he throws the dagger yeah, at john's wrist yeah the only yeah. way it could have been better is if Oberon was in it, but I'll, well, he, I'll he's been dead that. for a long time. I can't bring him that. back. From that, bro. <laughs> yeah, <I'm sorry. laughs> do it big, dirty. Get a little malice, baby, yeah. before, we before sign I sign him here. off. Okay, yeah, yeah. a little sign off Cheers. malice. How about that? Mm. I mean, but, this has been one of the funnest ones we've done because everything we did today was all off of our own thoughts and our own uh, and what we wanted to see. So. It's brand new for everybody uh, hearing it for the first time, and it came directly from us instead of having us take notes on something. Oh, so. it's awesome! And definitely comment on it. I, I mean, if you had an opinion or com- you know, message us on Instagram, yeah. or tell us your, what you would have liked to see <clears throat> how it ended. We we love to hear that stuff. So yeah, as Even, always, guys. You know, we always have to tell you uh, if you liked what you saw here today, click like, subscribe, comment, uh, reach out to us. The uh, the fan engagement and interaction is uh, what we do it for. So. Uh, but until next time, because I uh, know that we gave you the big scoop of our bonus episode next week. Uh, <laughs> big dirty. We'll talk about our second rewrite as well as some of the other things that yeah. uh, I'll keep a secret for now. Um, but uh, as of today, this has been another ridiculous installment. Targaryen. And the Stark. Factor Fantasy. Signing, Signing off. off.